In this tutorial, we're just going to discuss meshing with Gmesh with multiple faults in both 2D and 3D. And both of these are based on the 2019 Ridgecrest earthquake. First, we'll talk about the Gmesh and Qubit workflow. These are, this is sort of the general workflow for many finite element mesh generation tools. Uh, there, and we'll point out some of the differences between Gmesh and Qubit. In both cases, and in nearly all cases of fine element mesh generators, we first create the geometry. Now you can create the surfaces from points, curves, or uh, and build up to create surfaces and volumes, or uh, most mesh generation tools have uh, geometry engines that allow you to create basic shapes, such as cylinders, uh, spheres, uh, and uh, rectangular prisms. Uh, and cones, but generally, if we're going to use a basic shape, you know, we might use a sphere uh, on occasion, but mostly we're using things like the brick rectangular prism shape. Uh, once we have a domain, uh, we will often subdivide to create any interior surfaces. Those are generally our fault surfaces. The fault surfaces must uh, be in the geometry engine. That's how uh, we define and make sure that uh, cells are aligned along the fault surface, and we can split the mesh and insert our cohesive cells. Um, one thing to note is that when you do constructor geometry, we don't need separate volumes uh, for variations and parameters of material properties. We do need separate volumes for different constitutive models. So if you have a purely elastic model on part of your domain and a viscoelastic model on another part of the domain, you need separate volumes in 3D or surfaces in 2D uh, so that you can have uh, mark those appropriately and we can use different material models um, for those. We have to mark our boundaries and uh, that in both uh, Qubit and Gmesh, those are done in specific ways for compatibility with how Pyleth expects the input. In Gmesh, you generally tag the geometry before doing the mesh. And in Qubit, uh, we generally tag after generating the mesh. Currently in Qubit, we create node sets where based on the, vertis, uh, on the nodes of the cells that correspond to particular geometric entities. And so we need the mesh uh, to have been generated to extract what those nodes are. In Gmesh, we're creating physical groups associated with uh, the geometric entity. So we can do that uh, before we generate the mesh. And then when the mesh is generated, any entities lying on those uh, geometric entities are, in, are tagged in the final applet file. Then there's the creation, the, the final mesh itself and writing to file. A little bit more about uh, tagging surfaces. Um, in 2D, we tag the surfaces. In, volume, in, in 3D, we tag the volumes. We tag the entities for each boundary condition or fault. And don't forget to tag entities for buried fault edges. Um, we often tag the ground surface because we want to output the ground surface because that's where we have observations. In creating the mesh, the general procedure is to specify the meshing scheme, that is, what type of algorithm do you want to use to generate the mesh? What cell shape do you want it to generate? Um, we also specify mesh sizing information, how big those cells should be. How do you want that to vary in space? Then there's usually just a button to click or command to run to generate the mesh. And we often do cleanup after generating this to fix any poor quality cells. So mesh generation Tips are to keep in mind the scales of the observations that you're modeling. Uh, now with LiDAR and synthetic aperture radar, we know the topography of the Earth very well, um, down to resolutions that are far finer than anything you really need to include uh, in most modeling efforts. Our basic recommendation is to no ignore topography and bathymetry unless you know it matters. If the scale of your model is on the scale of the topography, um, which often, ha often happens in a volcano, but it's relatively rare for an earthquake, um, then yes, include the topography um, because it'll affect your solution. Uh, one recommendation is to do a model without topography, uh, like a flat model, and then do a model with topography and see how much it affects your solution. Uh, fault surfaces. It's often easiest to build surfaces from contours. You can uh, also 
create a fault trace. And then if you don't really know information about depth, you can just extrude that trace uh, down at some dip angle. Include features at a resolution that matters. Uh, if you're looking at a very just general uh, fault uh, deformation and, and your co-seismic slip distribution you know, is very uh, smooth, uh, then there's probably no reason to include very fine scale details of the fault rupture in terms of geometry, unless you have very close uh, resolution and a number of stations very close to the fault. If, you, if your, most of your stations are well away from the fault, then those small scale features aren't going to matter. Um, in terms of performance of the mesh generators, the number of points and splines and curved surfaces often has a huge effect on mesh generation runtime. Uh, that is somewhat dependent on which mesh generation package you're using. Um, and as we've discussed in tutorials uh, with Pilot version 4, the uniform refinement and increasing the beta disorder uh, means that you can often get a uh, very good performance with a relatively coarse mesh. Um, so as long as you're capturing the geometry, uh, you can use uniform refinement in Pilot to increase the resolution everywhere. All you need is that basic variation in cell size that the mesh generator generates. Um, and even with a relatively coarse mesh, if you use a basis order of two, uh, you can get quite accurate results even with large cells. But you do need to capture the geometry. Um, so that's why they have the focus on topography and fault surfaces, but don't include fine scale if you really don't need it. With most generation packages, you have a choice of the type of cells. Of the hex quad cells are slightly more accurate and faster because they have more points um, than, uh, than the tetrahedral and triangle. Um, so they have more terms in their basis functions. Uh, the tet and tries are about the simplest uh, elements you can have for a given geometry. However, the tetrahedral and triangles can handle very complex geometry quite easily. Um, you do need to be careful about mesh quality because you can get uh, what are called slivers, distorted elements. So make sure you're checking your elements, your mesh quality. Um, it's easy to vary the discretization with tetrahedral triangles and quad cells in general. Um, both qubit and G-mesh allow you to do that variation. Um, hexahedra is much more difficult because of the structured nature of the grids that are generated. Uh, there really is no easy answer to which cell size to use. It's a little problem in geometry specific. Um, and you may find that for a given accuracy, a finer resolution tet mesh um, can vary the, op vary the discretization size in a more optimal way and run faster than a hex mesh. Um, and sort of the poor resolution of a, of a tetrahedral or triangular mesh can be enhanced by using a basis order of two. Uh, finally, check and double check your mesh. Um, you know, even if you get an output file where there are errors that qubit or G mesh uh, or warnings that they mentioned that might indicate something is wrong, uh, in the output file, you want to look at and make sure all the boundaries are marked correctly. And even before you export uh, to a file, uh, it's best to check to make sure your boundaries are marked correctly. Sometimes if you adjust geometry, you forget to mark the boundaries in the same way, and maybe the ID or label of a curve has changed. And so you need to update those, and you'll, you'll find like um, a particular boundary that has multiple curves, maybe part of the boundary isn't marked because of a change in, in the geometry that something got relabeled, the identity, uh, an ID value changed in Gmesh or Qubit. Um, and as I mentioned before, make sure you check mesh quality. There's a lot of different metrics you can use to look at mesh quality. We often looked at condition number. Um, most mesh quality metrics, the ideal value is around zero. Uh, some values and some mesh generators prefer reporting things between zero and one. Others go between like one and infinity um, with one being ideal. And so uh, basically if you're near zero or near infinity, you probably have a problem with your mesh um, regardless of what metric you're using. Some other tips. Um, changes in geometry can cause changes in object IDs. The best sort of workaround and, and practice for doing this is to use is to name your objects 
use variables to eliminate hardwired IDs wherever possible. Uh, this is one reason why we've uh, migrated our qubit scripts away from journal files and towards Python scripts. It makes it easier to uh, assign, get IDs and assign them to variable names. Uh, within qubit, we do a lot of naming of objects. Within Gmesh, uh, it's much more geared towards the scripting uh, with its Python interface. And so we'll assign uh, values uh, or IDs that are returned by the mesh generation tools um, to variables that we keep around. Uh, we can also, uh, within both tools, get information about lower dimension entities. So you can, from a volume, you can get information about the bounding surfaces. Uh, you don't necessarily know which surfaces is which. Um, within qubit, there's uh, these commands that are called idealist that, that basically uses the centroid of an object to identify it, which means uh, as long as you haven't changed the geometry enough that the centroid is changed, um, even if it has a different ID, if you use that idealist uh, command uh, to identify it, you can save that and uh, you will have access and I, you can identify that uh, entity uniquely. Gmesh, uh, I, you can select entities based on a bounding box, but it doesn't have that same type of capabilities. Um, so in some cases, we'll just look at the graphical user interface, see what the IDs are, record those, and then we know if we change the geometry, we need to come back to that particular part of the script and make sure the IDs haven't changed. Um, splines with many points can slow down operations. That is especially true if you're trying to put in, say, topography and you're using a bunch of splines. Um, when Gmesh or Qubit are trying to figure out where to put a point on the surface, it has to evaluate um, all those splines. And uh, a spline surface takes uh, significantly more overhead to evaluate than, say, a spline curve. So uh, minimize the number of points on the spline if you can, optimize their location, and consider alternative ways to specify the geometry. Surfaces that meet in small angles can create distorted cells. This often happens um, with things like reverse faults with a very shallow dip angle, subduction zones with a very shallow dip angle, or a particular geologic structure that's coming together at a very small angle. Um, one way to get around this is to keep those surfaces, but then trim the geometry to eliminate features that are smaller than the cell size. So at the very edges or tips of, their, of that geometry, you can basically pinch it off and create a, a larger angle uh, that uh, will give uh, a good uh, cell aspect ratio. It uh, can be difficult to mesh complex geometry with a hexahedron, quadrilateral cells. Um, and so in those cases, it's probably best to use tetrahedral triangular cells, even if it requires a bit finer mesh. Um, and as I mentioned before, you can also increase the basis order to better resolve those things. Um, hexahedral meshes tend to oversample parts of the domain. Um, this can cause problems if you're uh, trying to do a very large 3D mesh and you need fine resolution in one place. It can be hard to coarsen the mesh uh, over other parts. That's particularly true um, in, in Gmesh where you don't maybe don't have as much uh, flexibility. Qubit can do uh, some particular refinement um, variations um, for uh, handling hexahedral meshes. Um, so in those cases, sometimes it's better to just use a tetrahedral mesh, which allows you to vary the discretization size the way you want to. Um, in some cases, uh, when you have like a fault surface and they're intersecting and you're in Qubit and you need to um, create volume so that the mesh generator will honor those surfaces, uh, extending the surfaces away from, from to, to you hit intersect uh, external boundaries can create very complex geometry. Um, this is somewhat of a deficiency in qubit. Sometimes you can create the geometry, but it won't mesh it. Um, in Gmesh, uh, in, with both the OpenCast K geometry engine as well as the built-in geometry engine, you can embed surfaces. Uh, and this often greatly simplifies your geometry construction um, and uh, result in a nice clean uh, mesh generation. So now we're gonna talk about uh, the 2D case specifically, and then we'll move on to 3D. 
In this case, we have a domain that's 80 kilometers by 80 kilometers. We're doing a horizontal cross section of intersecting strike slip faults. This is loosely based on the Ridgecrest earthquake. We have a main fault here that is through going. And then we have two faults coming off uh, that intersect the main fault at the same point. We have what we call fault west and fault east. And so what we'll do is we'll create a domain, then we'll create the main faults and uh, these um, other faults. And these, we have points and files that demarcate the surface traces of these. So translating this into a, sort of a scheme for, for GMesh, we're going to create points. We're going to label, we're going to do a georeference model. So we're using UTM as zone 11 north for our coordinate system. We're going to create and label things relative to uh, geographic direction. So we'll do point northwest, point southwest, point southeast, point northeast. We'll label the north boundary, our curve north, curve west, curve south, curve east. Our curves have directions. Um, and then we'll put in our fault surfaces. Um, and uh, since we're embedding, we don't really care about the directions of those or even necessarily the points. Um, just We just need to make sure that all the fault traces have a common point at their common intersection. So in setting up the model, first we're going to prepare the fault traces and uh, sort of the general scheme of we need to choose an appropriate resolution of our fault trace information. In this case, we're not using a, uh, a detailed model for the fault traces because we're more concerned about workflow uh, than necessarily the accuracy of recreating specific fault trace information. So our main fault trace uh, has seven points and our other fault traces have something like five points. Um, uh, uh, various studies have used much higher resolution information and, and you can use those data um, to uh, create your own mesh at a higher resolution if you want to. We do need to choose a geographic projection, projection for our georeferencing. As I mentioned, we use UTM Zone 11 North. Uh, one of the things about the projection library is it now includes um, the EPSG codes that will translate directly into the full uh, standard geographic projection. So you don't have to worry about specifying things like datums, uh, and um, and uh, or developing your own projection. So a great resource is to is to look up ESP EPSG codes um, for whatever projection you want. There's uh, codes for projections all over the world. Using standard projections for your region is a good idea because someone has gone to uh, um, you know the lengths to create those projections with. Uh, good georeferencing, it means you can convert from things like latitude, longitude, and WGS84 directly to those projections and have confidence that everything is georeferenced, uh, usually down to about the meter level accuracy. So our fault traces are given in latitude, longitude, that course in the WGS84 reference frame, that corresponds to EPSG code 4326. The UTM 11 North, uh, and I believe um, it's either the NAT83 or the WGS84 is referred to as the uh, EPSG code 32611, the 11 corresponding to the zone, um, and the 326 corresponding to both uh, the datum as well as whether you're north or south. Uh, we can use the projection uh, command line routine CS to CS to convert from latitude longitude to um, our geographic projection, that command is included in the pilot binary. Um, and then of course, in preparing our fault traces, as I mentioned before, we need to ensure that they have common points at the intersection. So once we have the, the fault traces prepared, we can look at their dimensions and pick our overall dimensions for our domain. In this case, uh, we're gonna pick 80 kilometers by 80 kilometers. Um, it puts our edge of the domain a couple fault lengths um, from uh, the, the faults themselves. Uh, if we were doing a research grade problem, we'd probably double that um, to make sure that our displacements um, when we do fixed boundaries are well away from the domain and not, and not uh, the deformation near the faults is not sensitive uh, to the size of our boundary or domain. 
Um, creating the geometry, we're going to create the domain. We'll go from points, curves, create a curve loop to surface. Uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to load, uh, create the fault traces by reading fault traces from the file using the, the NumPy uh, load text command. Um, and uh, what you'll see is, is that one, one of the nice things about using the Python scripts in either Gmesh or Qubit is you can access information from files. This was not generally true as well when in Qubit journal files. Um, and so it, it's a nice uh, way to leverage the fact that we have the Python uh, lang programming language that we can leverage and add some additional tools um, to be able to read in files um, and and do and do those uh, things. Um, we read in the points, we convert the points to splines, we clean up duplicate points, and then we embed the fault curves, which are dimension one, in the higher dimension surface, dimension two, using the embed. Um, so let's first, um, we'll put these slides aside for a minute. And let's first look at our fault traces. So here we're now in Crustal strike slip 2D, the fault trace uh, in latitude longitude is quite fault trace underscore main lat long dot text. It's basically latitude longitude values. Um, and there's one file for each fault trace. We use a little bash script to convert fault traces that loops over the main fault east and fault trace. Uh, loads those files, spits them out and sends them to the coordinate system, the coordinate system. We give the source EPSG code, the destination ESPG code, and that automatically transforms from this coordinate system to that coordinate system. And we dump the output to the fault trace uh, where we've uh, added the extension underscore UTM to indicate that we have transformed it into our UTM coordinate system. When we do that, we end up with a file that looks like this. Here's our, our easting coordinate, our northern coordinate, and then the Z coordinate, everything uh, that with um, the CS to CS command that doesn't see, it automatically just adds a zero for the third uh, dimension. And so we can run um, that command. So you just bash convert fault traces dot sh, and you can see that that's exactly what was produced. Um, as I showed in the file. So now we have our fault traces. We can look at our mesh generation routine. And so this looks like many of our other qubit scripts. I mean, not qubit scripts, our gmesh scripts. We're going to use Nemesis to run this because we want to use the uh, Python that's uh, included with Pyloth rather than any system Python. That ensures binary compatibility. We're going to load our fault traces using NumPy. Um, so we need to import that module. We need to import Gmesh. We import our helpful routines from Gmesh Utils for Vertex Group, Material Group, and our Generate Mesh application. We inherit for our local application, we inherit from G Generate Mesh that just provides uh, the command line arguments, make sure our routines get called appropriately for the given command line argument. We include a little comment here that gives uh, an overview of the mesh so you don't have to be looking at the manual to get an idea of what we're doing. We have a common point of intersection. Um, we've labeled the points uh, and the faults. Um, next, we define some constants. So we're gonna find the X coordinate of our west, east uh, boundaries, and then well as for our south and north boundaries and the Y coordinate. Um, these are correspond to easting and northern coordinates. Uh, in the UTM zone. We specify our files with the coordinates of our fault traces in the UTM zone 11. So they're georeferenced, same coordinate system as what our model is. We're gonna specify our, our discretization sizes on the fault. We're gonna do a kilometer and uh, we'll have a bias value of 1.07. Uh, that's the gradient in the mesh size of increasing with distance from the fault. We are going to uh, create um, different uh, options for our met, for our cell shape. Um, we're going to use the triangular version. Um, you can generate the quad. I think the quad will work, um, but generally we're doing the, the triangulated mesh uh, because it gives such good quality uh, in 2D. Um, and 
Then the next thing we define is a routine to create points from a file. So we pass in the file of a fault trace. Uh, we use the numpy load text command to give, get the coordinates. It's going to give us arrays. Uh, we're going to create an array of points based on those coordinates. So for every x, y coordinate pair in our coordinates array, we're going to create a point uh, in GMesh, update our array of points, um, and then uh, return that um, uh, those points. Uh, and I realized you, you could clean up that with Python and do it all in one line if you wanted to. Um, let's see. Okay, next we have our create geometry uh, function. So we'll start by creating points for the domain. So we have our southwest, southeast, northeast, northwest points. We uh, set the coordinates of those based on our constants that we defined up above. Uh, we create curves for the domain for the domain along our boundaries, so we hook points together. Remember, the direction matters. We need to be consistent. We name our curves, so between the southwest and southeast, that's our southern boundary, so we call it C underscore S, C meaning curve, S, I mean south, corresponding to the direction of our boundary aligned with the coordinate system, so we have north, south, east, west uh, curves on our boundary of our domain. We create a curve loop uh, that then we create the surface from, and we save that surface. We, there's no reason for us to save uh, the ID of that curve loop. So that's our domain. That's a nice square. Um, and then next, we create our points for the main fault. So we call our function create points from fault from file, give it the name of the uh, main trace, um, read in those points. These are GMesh points. And then we want to we look at that file and we want to make sure we note which point is the fault intersection. So we use uh, this is hardwired in that the third uh, zero based index point uh, is our intersection point. We then create a spline, not a curve, because we're going to uh, end the by using a spline. We're using as um, not a B spline, but a spline that'll uh, the curve or the, the spline curve will go through all of our points. Um, if, if you use a B spline, then it's going to use that as parameters for a spline, but not go through those points. Um, finally, uh, we're going to split that curve at the intersection. So we have have one spline that covers all of those. That gives us a nice smooth fault trace. Um, and then we split it. If we were to create a spline with each side, uh, using just a subset, then we'd have a discontinuity and slope at the intersection. So doing one whole uh, spline curve and then splitting it uh, means we have um, a continuous slope in our curve along uh, in terms of the geometry. Uh, and then we keep track of the ends of our main fault. Um, and so that's the first point and last point um, that was created coming back from our create points from file. So for the west trace, we do the same thing. We don't have, we don't need to split the curve because we don't have any intersections. Um, and then the same thing for the east strand. Um, so uh, create the points and then save uh, the spline surface or spline curve. Now uh, we have duplicate points at the intersections, so we need to remove all duplicates so that we don't end up with floating vertices. Uh, we synchronize so that we make sure that everything is consistent across all of our entities. And then we can embed our curves, which are dimension one. That's the first argument. And then um, in the surface, so we're always embedding in the domain and, and that's a dimension two. So that it's, it's uh, tags are in GMesh are done by the dimension and then the ID. And so that's why we often, sometimes these are a tuple in Python, sometimes they're different arguments. Um, in this case, there's uh, we have multiple curves for the main fault, we have a single curve, and so it's an array of just uh, the names of the entities at that given dimension. Once we've embedded, we synchronize to make sure everything's synced up. Um, and then uh, we wanna get the points at the ends of our, um, our branches. And so instead, because we uh, 
we remove duplicates. We didn't want to get those when we read them in. We want to do it after everything's cleaned up. Um, and Gmesh has this nice uh, command, uh, get adjacencies, and says, we want to get the lower dimension. Uh, that's the second argument. You can get what you can get the first, sorry, not argument. The first return value is the upper higher dimension entities. The second, uh, second return value is the lower dimension entities. In this case, we want to get the points that are at the ends of the fault. And so uh, we go uh, uh, to specify what curves those are. It's the tag as well as the dimension. And here I've explicitly said um, what the arguments are. Um, up here, I did not. Um... <laughs> So let's run that bunch of the of the script and we'll look at our geometry. So we're going to do um, generate GMesh. We're going to do the geometry and let's load it into the GUI. And here's what we have. You can see all our, our domain. You can see all of our points. We have a nice smooth spline curve for our main fault trace. And then uh, we have a sort of finer scale uh, fault trace information for our west trace, east trace. Um, and if we zoom in, you'll see we have a point there, point 0.8. Look at this curve. It has point 0.8 on the end. This curve has point 0.8 on the end. This curve has point 0.8 on the end. And that curve has point 0.8 on the end. So that means all three of these, all four of these curves have a common point here, and that's important. If we had our main fault trace that didn't have this point, then we'd have spells, cells that we're trying to split across here, and that would uh, mess up our cell geometry, and, and either the mesh generation would fail or pilot would fail because we didn't have consistent information. So that's our geometry. Um, let's get back to marking. Marking is the same. Really, no matter how complex the ge the geometry is, it's really independent. It looks very much the same across all of our meshes. In this case, we're just going to do one material over the entire surface. So we tag it with one. That's going to be our label value in Pilot. We create the physical group. We're going to do uh, mark our boundaries. So north, south, east, west, a different tag. We give it the dimension and then the entities. We just have one curve along each boundary. It's dimension one because it's a curve. These are the label values we'll need in Pilot. This is the label name corresponds to the physical group name. For our faults, um, we have main, west, east. So I've used a tag of 20, 21, 22. For the fault ends, I've done the sort of add 10 to each of those tags, so 30, 31, 32. That just helps me remember that when in my pilot parameter file, um, for the ends, I should see label values of 30, whereas for my faults, it's label values of 20. That's just a visual check um, that makes it easier to catch errors. Uh, the ends are points, so they have dimension zero. The fault surfaces, false curves themselves are dimension one. There's the entities. Um, the curves fault main is array of two, so we don't need to put square brackets around it. Create the physical groups. So very similar to what we've done for all of our other mesh generations that had simpler geometry. Um, so now instead of just geometry, we'll add in marking the geometry. Now, if we click tools and visibility, we bring up and you can see we have our material ID, we have our curves around for our boundaries. So we can look at those. We have our three faults, which is there. Then we have our lower dimension points for our boundaries and our fault ends and so forth. Um, so uh, easy way to, uh, to view our data, mark it up, uh, works quite well. So oh, that's marking. Now let's get back to the mesh generation. It's also very simple. It looks very similar to what we do for um, a strike slip 2D, reverse 2D. Um, we don't use the default sizing related to size from points or curvature or extending away from the boundary. We're going to do distance from the fault. So we get uh, our fault curves. 
created a list. We add in sort of um, our west and east fault traces to that. That gives us all our IDs that go into the curve list to create a distance from those entities. And it's taking the minimum distance um, from across those entities. We use our um, generate mesh function, get math progression that does this variable mesh sizing given uh, the distance field and a minimum cell size, and then uh, our gradient or bias that in, uh, increases the cell size for values larger than one. We set the cell size to, to evaluate this math expression. This is a uh, specific GMesh syntax in terms of what this F means, our math expression field size. Um, and then uh, we say use that field size as the background um, field size for our overall mesh. And then um, we generate the mesh and do Laplacian smoothing. So these the last line, this routine looks basically identical as many of our other routines, except we've changed uh, in 2D, we've changed which curves uh, we're getting our, our distance values from. So let's generate the mesh. We'll just generate, we don't need to write it. Uh, one thing to check is that there are no errors. It tells us it was meshing, told us how many nodes and cells it generated. Here's our beautiful mesh. Um, you'll see we have a gradation in, in cell size. We're finer uh, and it slowly increases in cell size as you come away with, in terms of distance. If we zoom way in, you'll see that uh, we can we make sure we have a common point at the intersection. We see all of our cells are being aligned right along the fault. Of course, it's it's doing a, a discretization at what at the cell size we gave it of that geometry, so they're not perfectly aligned. Um, and if I can, whoops, whoops, back out a little bit. Uh, there we go. Right click to translate. So they're all along our fault surface. We're getting a nice clean. And then once we come to the end, then GMesh knows, hey, I can do sort of a, a more unstructured grid until I get um, embedding uh, within the rest of the domain. So you can see our, our cell quality isn't quite as good right here at the, at the end, um, but it's still pretty good. Uh, and you'll see it right here in the middle, we have very good, nice equilateral. There's a little bit of a difference when we transition um, and grow in the cell size, it decides it needs to increase the cell size a bit. Again, everything seems to be aligned. You'll notice here that it took the spline curve, but it's still, even though it didn't necessarily have to put a, a vertex of our mesh right here at a point along our spline curve, but it, it did put points along the spine curve and honor, um, we do have an edge of, this, of the triangular cells aligned with our spline. So that's a 2D mesh generation. Um, and we could check the mesh quality. So tools, plugins, we'll do the inverse of the condition number, create a view and run it. So here you can see our mesh quality is very high. Our minimum value is 0 0.73 so, or 74. So very high mesh quality. We don't have any slivered triangles. A lot of values are you know, greater than 0 0.9. So very, very good mesh quality. This is the type of mesh you'd expect to see in 2D. Another thing to point out is it's a small number of cells that have Poor mesh quality, so it you know the little effect on the rate of convergence, but not much, um, especially for such high high quality mesh. All right, let's go back to our slides. Trying to catch up where we review what we've come through so far. So we embedded the curves that are dimension one, then domain surface dimension two using the embed command. Um, when we created the mesh, we marked the boundaries, interfaces and materials, we generated the mesh, 
We chose the cell size and the faults. That's the region with the highest strain gradient. So that's why we wanted the smallest mesh size there. We wanted it small enough to resolve the geometry and the slip distribution. And remember, we can refine and use higher order discretization to increase that resolution further. We created our field with distance from the faults. We created the field with cell size based on that distance. We chose a gradient for increasing the cell size away from the faults. Typically, we use values around 1.05 to 1.1. If you get much larger than 1.1, the gradient is just too fast um, and you're not gonna resolve the deformation well. Um, and you may also increase the amount of distorted elements you have. Uh, with values less than 1.1, we can still have good quality while an increase in the cell size with distance. We generate the mesh using the cell size field, and then we applied Laplacian smoothing to improve the mesh quality. So there is our mesh. Now we're going to go on to uh, the 3D version of this problem. So this is our geometry, uh, and what we're doing is we're taking those false surfaces we're creating a 3D, uh, uh, 2D surface out of them by extruding it with depth. We're just going to assume vertical faults in this case for simplicity. Um, we could give these a uh, when we ex we're going to extrude those fault surface traces down to depth. We give an angle, uh, sorry, a direction vector. And so, if we wanted to put a dip on those, we would instead of having a, a direction that's zero zero minus one, we would compute, you know, what is the a down dip direction of the fault trace. Um, and then we could extrude in that direction and it would, uh, GMesh would just extrude that geometry down. Um, we can uh, don't necessarily, we can create more complicated fault surfaces um, by building up from curves and, and putting those curves into uh, more complicated surfaces. Uh, our square becomes a rectangular prism in 3D and we have boundaries north, south, east, west, top, and bottom, and we use our same naming scheme for our faults. Uh, we're going to use the open cascade geometry engine um, to create the solid geometry. GMesh has both open cascade as, as well as a, uh, its own geometry engine. Open cascade, uh, not every open cascade, which is a CAD engine um, routine, is available within GMesh, but there's a lot of them that you can do complex geometry. Um, and there's this is a, this open cascade is a it's a hyperlink to the open cascade website if you want more information um, about open cascade. So setting up the model, we prepare our fault traces in the same way, exact same way as we did in two D. We need to choose how to extend those surfaces to depth. We're going to assume vertical faults. Um, choose dimensions of our domain. In this case, we're going to keep it roughly eighty kilometers by eighty kilometers, and then go forty kilometers deep. The reason why I chose 60 kilometers is that in the I wanted to match the qubit mesh that there's a py, Python qubit uh, script in the same and it requires extending the fault surfaces away and in order to sort of uh, minimize what uh, geometric complexities at the boundaries, it paid off to just slightly adjust uh, the domain dimensions of the domain to avoid intersections near the corners. Um, so that's why I, I, this is not 80 kilometers by 80 kilometers by 40. Um, so uh, our workflow, we're going to create a box. So we're not going to build up from points and, and curves to create the box. We're just going to go, boom, create a box of the right dimensions. Um, we're going to create uh, the fault surfaces in the same way that we did before, only now we extrude the curves to form surfaces using, using the open cascade extrude command. Then we embed those fault surfaces where our dimension two and our domain surface dimension three using fragment. Now the built-in GMesh geometry engine doesn't have a fragment routine. Um, and so you do it a little different. Um, and you, what you do is you uh, first have to embed your fault uh, trace, surface trace in the top surface, and then you embed your fault surface uh, in the volume. So it, it takes sort of two steps, whereas open cascade, boom, fragment. Um, uh, it identifies, you know, how your surface intersected the, the surface and how to do the intersections. All of that is handled um, directly at the open cascade geometry engine. Uh, and then we're going to, it's much more, because we're not building up from points to curves to surfaces, we don't know the identity of all of our lower dimension uh, entities such as curves and points. 
And so we will use the GUI uh, to identify the geometric entities, and then uh, we will assign those entity IDs to variables. Uh, and I want to reiterate that um, we make this very explicit in the Python script of I needed to go to the GUI and um, identify the values of those IDs. Um, this is much better than just using those IDs later in the mesh because I, by assigning it to a variable, it makes all of the remaining mesh commands uh, very clear of what I'm doing. Whereas if I just use ID values, it's like, what does ID five mean? I don't know which surface that is. Um, by using variable names, it gives a meaning. If I change the geometry, I can go back to just the part of the script where I'm assigning those IDs and double check very quickly that I have the right IDs and things haven't changed. Or if they've changed, it's easy to make the change just right there in a small portion of the code. Uh, overall process is identically the same. We mark boundaries, interface the materials, generate the mesh, apply a plus and smoothing. And then of course, we're gonna check the um, mesh along the fault trace for any issues. Um, and that's what our mesh will look like. So let's look at the script that we use to generate that. So uh, here we'll bring over our scripts. That's the 2D one. We need to go to Crustal Strike Slip 3D and find our generate GMesh script. Top level looks essentially the same, import NumPy, import GMesh, import our helper stuff. We have the same figure that's just the map view of what our looks of what we look like. Now we're going to do things a little bit different. Instead of you know needing the coordinates of the boundaries, we're going to give a domain center dimensions in each of the coordinate directions uh, and our depth uh, extent of the faults. Again, we have our fault traces. Uh, we're going to do a slightly different discretization size just to keep the mesh size down so we don't um, create too large of files that we embedded in our um, binary packages and, and so forth. Uh, same bias as a function of distance from the fault. Um, and you can play around with what this discretization size is. Just don't make it too small. Um, and we're doing just a TET mesh uh, with our embedded surfaces. Uh, we can't do a hexahedral mesh. Same uh, command or, or function for creating our points from the file. Uh, create the geometry routine. We read in our uh, first, we create the domain. So we're going to create coordinates of our points based on the center of the domain and our dimensions. Um, so we have XYZ for Southwest. Um, and so for our box, we need the we need the the Southwest corner of the box and then the dimensions in each in the directions uh, uh coordinate directions to give the overall size of the box and so we picked the southwest corner we put it so um the bottom of the domain is minus the dimension uh, domain length of the domain in the z direction that puts our top surface at z equals zero um and then in terms of generating the faults uh we create the points we create the spline and then the main difference from our 2D is now we're going to extrude it. And so how far to extrude it? We go 0, 0 minus the fault depth. So it's going to be a vertical fault. We're only extruding in the Z direction. Um, we're extruding a spline in uh, that's dimension 1. So we have this uh, pair of the dimension and then the, the curve um, that, it, that we want to extrude. Uh, we get a bunch of tags out of that. Um, that are the of the entities related to uh, what was created when we extruded, uh, and it turns out that the the uh, the surface is uh, has index one one in the array of it's a multi dimensional array of tags that's coming out. Um, fault west, we do the same thing. Um, one thing to notice instead of a geo for our our. Geometric engine, we're using OCC for open cascade. So make note of that. Don't try to do some of these commands using the, the geo uh, built-in geometry engine because they're not available. Um, the spline is, but um, extrude I don't think is, and certainly fragment is not. Um, so again, we do pretty much the same thing for the spline, get our extrude it, get out our tags. Now, um, 
here's where things uh, def def deviate from our 2D. We're going to use the open cascade fragment command. Uh, it looks somewhat similar in that we are going to fragment our volumetric domain that's in uh, dimension equals three with our each of our fault surface. So first we fragment with our main fault. And then we fragment uh, with our west and then east fault because these are all designed to be, uh, we had a vertical uh, extrusion. We had a common intersection point. We don't have to worry about the intersections. Um, we tell it to remove our, our, our uh, a, the tool that is left around um, to do that uh, fragmentation. Then we then need to synchronize to make sure everything is consistent. Uh, across the, the mesh engine and geometry engine. Um, the next thing we do is we want to, this is where we're picking out our surface ideas IDs using the GUI. Um, so uh, one thing that we can do is we'll pull up our, move that aside, let's run, um, we're still in the strengths. The 2D crustal strike slip 3D and generate GMesh, generate geometry, load up the GUI. So that's now we see now we can go in and I can't really fit it on my screen here very well um, and keep the font size big, but we'll do our best to sort of fit both of these things on. So I, I'm pulling out the uh, the lower dimension surfaces from my volume. Um, and so I can go in here and look and see, come on, pull up my surface. It's not finding me. So let's see, let's get tools visibility. This will make it a lot easier. So instead of having to, oops, need to get my domain oriented the way I want it. So now over here, I can click like, well, what is my surface nine? Well, show me what surface it is. That's false. I want to, oh, 10 is my, is 10 my boundary? It is. So uh, I can look and see what IDs were given back in my surfaces. And then I, uh, what I did is I went through in, in the debugger, um, Python debugger, I stopped here, uh, looked and see what order it was giving my surfaces. So I found it was going west, south, top, north, bottom, east, um, and to be able to identify those for these other surfaces, like um, there was our, our 17 and 18 surfaces are the main fault trace. So this should be, there's our Northern section. There's our Southern section, that's 17 and 18. That corresponds there. 16 should be the West fault trace. There's 16 and then nine was our East fault trace. So nine, 16, whoop, six, 16, 17, 18, if I do apply, there we're getting all of our fault information, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, those should be, oops, although it pulled off, yeah, my by betting my top surface, it pulled in the curves associated with uh, that top surface. So that means that this top surface, um, you'll notice that when I put, uh, and to, it's the open cascade has created a B spline along those. Um, and you can see that it says on boundary surface 17. And if we click on 17, that should be, oops. That's that was the top surface. We find the top surface itself. There we go. You can see that these curves are part of that surface, which is exactly what we want. If they weren't, then we wouldn't have um, our cells on range. So there's our full volume. So that's how we got um, all of uh, these values. The same thing for sort of our edges of our faults. Now these buried edges are curves. And so I've identified the curves of those mouse over 
you can get those. Um, so it's very easy to check these using the GUI as I was just showing. Um, then again, we mark, we have one material in our volume domain. We mark our boundaries. Now we have six boundaries. We get the tag. These are the label values we'll use in Pilot. Um, the dimension of the surfaces, one surface for all the boundaries. Um, so it's, a, it's an array of one. Fault main west looks very similar to what we had before in 2D. Right now the entities are surfaces in dimension two rather than curves in dimension one. Our edges are now, uh, we get those edges there dimension one. We tag them the same sort of 10 higher than the corresponding tag. Uh, create the physical group. The generating the cell size instead of a curve list, now it's a surface list, but it looks essentially the same. That's basically, this is the only line that's different um, compared to 2D and 3D. Um, although we mesh generate three to generate a three-dimensional mesh rather than a two-dimensional mesh. So like two lines different in our mesh generation routine. So let's run that command. Let's generate. Um, so there you can see it automatically spit out a bunch of information about created 18,000 tetrahedra in 0.15 uh, seconds. Uh, the mesh quality gives us some information. There, uh, and this is based on volume. Um, so it's doing its own little deciding metric. We'll look at the condition number um, to see how good the mesh is. But we end up with 21,000 elements, 3,724 nodes. This is what it looks like. You can't really see very much because uh, you can see everything inside. So we'll go tools, um, not tools, visibility. We want tools, options. It brings up this little box. We can click on geometry. We can say, well, don't show the points or curves uh, on the mesh. It's don't show, if we say, don't show 2D edges or 2D faces. Uh, and then, or we can say 3D faces and 3D edges, but not 2D faces. Um, so there you can see all the same color. You can see what the mesh looks like. It's a little bit coarser than our 2D mesh, but you can again see how uh, embedding the fault surface, we have a nice uh, fault surface um, that is uh, corresponds to what, um, the lines of cell faces along that uh, fault surface. And um, yeah, so the next thing we want, might want to check mesh quality. So let's go tools, plugins, and condition number, and create view. Let's do, let's see, uh, hiding threshold. I think if we say uh, threshold greater than, well, let's run that. So let's see what it says. I think that's, so our lowest, now we're down to 0.3. In 2D, we're at 0.7, still not too bad. Um, and if I remember which one to do, hiding threshold, threshold. I want to see help hiding threshold. So if I oops, go back to options, I think if I do uh, 0 0.5, run it. There we go. Um, so you see, these are all the ones that I think are less than 0 0.5. If we go to 0 0.4, you'll notice that now we're getting down to, there's just like four cells. There's this little guy here that has a poor mesh quality. Everything else is like 0.6 or better, so not too bad. Um, and uh, you can use the Pilot Viz script to look at an output file. Um, that you can use thresholding as well. Um, so that's generating the mesh. We've 
Get our slides. I don't think there's any more slides here. I think we've generated our mesh. So that completes this tutorial for 3D meshing. This is crustal strike slip 2D, crustal strike slip 3D. And um, there are parameter files for uniform slip on the faults as well as spatially variable slip. Uh, we don't have time to go through in depth in those tutorials, but they should be relatively straightforward that you can work through on your own to run these um, uh, routines and uh, they're covered and explained in the manual.